kindly continue the next session, the second session of your lecture. Thank okay. you, Professor. Right. Hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, um, Uh, professor, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. Uh, so now we have already uh, we have couple questions. So uh, which uh, format did you think is better? Shall we discuss it later after your uh, after your lecture, or now you want to dis discuss it first before we continue the lecture? Yeah, I think we can uh, we can take the lectures now. Uh, questions now. Those go oh. before we go further. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have several. Questions. Uh, one of it from Aldo Raventio Adam. He's one of the third year student. So he was interested to the uh, natural or biocoagulant such as uh, Moringa oliviera. In Indonesia, we call it daun kelor. So the question, uh, the questions were, uh, how do you think uh, about about the potential of biocoagulant as the main coagulant in the future, since uh, we know that the natural coagulant is renewable resources. And how about the mo uh, the Moringa's byproduct? Will it uh, produce uh, such kind of toxic uh, substances? Will it harm the environment or the human who are exposed by that uh, by byproduct? Uh, and is it better uh, compared to the traditional coagulant? So that uh, is the first question, Professor. Yeah. Um, the there are many advantages with uh, Moringa. The first is that it is not toxic in the drinking water treatment. And it is also cheap, cheaper compared with aluminum and uh, iron uh, products. And it also produces less sludge because it's, uh, it's, it's a, they, they, the process in such a way that it is not producing aluminum hydroxide, no hydroxides in the system. And uh, I'm not aware of any toxic uh, impacts for the during the production process, but it could be that I'm not aware of them. But as far as I, I uh, know that it is, there are no such effects. And of course, there is an issue of increased organic matter during the during the treatment process. But there are ways to deal with it, and uh, and whatever we get as the residual from uh, moringa-based coagulation, it's natural, it's organic matter, and uh, it can be dealt with. So I think it has a bigger potential. But right now we see aluminium and iron coagulants are much more efficient. If you think about the maximum treatment efficiency. Um, uh, and uh, I think uh, not only in, uh, in Asian and African countries, but also in Europe and US especially, there are a lot of research and even production. So there's uh, test productions are going on. So I think there is a future. We will see much more the higher use of Moringa in the future than today. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, Theo, have, uh, has your questions already answered or do you have any follow-up question? Uh, no, sir, thank you for your uh, answer. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah, thank I can also inform you that uh, uh, my group, together with a group at uh, Michigan State University, we are preparing a paper on natural coagulants, a review paper. And uh, probably this will be ready within the next two months and I will share it with you. So that will, you, you will see a lot of references about this. Oh, that sounds great. We are looking forward to read the paper. Yeah. And maybe one, yeah, maybe one more question. Um, this is actually an interesting question from Bunopa. If we use organic coagulant, will it obviously increase the burden of organic uh, loading in the biological treatment after the coagulation flocculation treatment and can we calculate the burden as a as the initial design parameter i think that's the question yes uh, when it comes to the amount of coagulants uh, or amount of organic matter which comes with the coagula coagulants is much much smaller or almost negligible compared with the amounts of organic matter which is in the wastewater so therefore, we wouldn't worry much about that. But the main point is to make them, uh, and, and the main point is that we are converting the organic content into particulate content. So during the coagulation, 
or mechanical processes. So this, or the separation process, it will be easily removed. Uh, so you don't have to have uh, microorganisms to work with. Uh, the, the the work with the um, uh, biodegradation of organic matter. So that's why I don't think that it's uh, that's going to be an issue. Okay, thank you. How about the answer, Bunova? Do you have any follow up question? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Professor Ratnawera. I'm actually currently working on research on phosphorus removal and recovery, but using biological treatment. So it's quite the opposite of you. So this is quite interesting topic to discuss yeah. further, actually. I could probably discuss you further. Thank you for the answer, Professor Ratnawera. Yes, uh, that's uh, my, my group is also working on phosphorus recovery. And uh, our challenge is more than 70% of our wastewater in Norway is treated with coagulation. And the after coagulation, uh, it claims that aluminum and iron binds with phosphate so strongly, the plants have a difficulty to access phosphorus. So uh. if you compare, yeah. So if you compare with uh, sludge from coagulation plant from a biological plant, some researchers claim that uh, access to phosphorus is less. So we are working with how it could be improved. So there are many interesting things to work on. <laughs> yes, that's true, yeah. that's true. Okay, thank yeah. you, we'll talk later. Right, um, yes, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, now I am, uh, you can see my full screen, right, again? It's like yeah, about can... coagulant dosing control, yes. We can see it perfectly, so, yeah. Yes. So now the dosing, so optimal coagulant dose is a function of flow, pH, particles, and uh, NOM, organic matter or phosphates. So if you are taking water from a river and you can understand the, the water quality is not the same, right? So if there is, uh, if there, if that is a rain period, then you can see the water, color of the water, the turbidity is changing quite rapidly and uh, microorganisms content is also changing quite rapidly. So that's why we cannot have a constant dose, right? So this is a figure from uh, Buaran River from Indonesia, I guess. And it shows that how the turbidity is changing during these months. So, uh, point, uh, yeah, you see that Turbidity during uh, June, July, August, it's almost nothing, minimum. But in some year, some months, I guess this is after uh, some heavy rains, it goes up to 15, 16,000. That's the erosion creates, right? So when you take drinking water from such a river, you cannot use the same coagulant dose which you used here as here. So which means that you have to find a way to define this. So, so there are, newer ways to uh, define this. I can talk about that later. And if you, if any of you want to do uh, your thesis on that, uh, I can also uh, suggest some interesting topics. Um, so, uh, so, but most treatment plants, they use flow proportional dosing. That means that they measure, every treatment plant measure the flow, amount of water which comes and goes through the plant and they multiply it by a coefficient and say that that is the coagulant dosage. And to deal with these type of huge variations, the plants are running so-called jar tests, lab-scale experiments. Sometimes every day, sometimes once a week, sometimes several times a day. And based on these jar tests, you can define the amount of coagulants that you are supposed to use, right? But it is also not good enough, according to my uh, understanding, because the quality of water changes so fast. So doing a jar test once a day or several times a day, it's not good enough. So we need to do it online. So there are techniques to deal with that. So let's see. So now I want to stop this uh, slide and uh, show you... Uh, show you a video. Um, let's see. Uh, 
now. Estimate. Can you see the full screen now, a video? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, okay. So this is just three minutes. Can you hear the voice? Not really clearly. Uh, I think if it will be great if you can increase the volume. Better now. Be effective, any changes Much better. Or adjustments on the water supply. Operators use jar tests. It allows them to see what the results will be in the laboratory and predict what will happen full scale without affecting the operation of the plant. Jar testing is an invaluable tool, but can be difficult to perform correctly. When accurate results are generated and correctly applied, jar testing can translate into better treatment and more optimized chemical dosing. Jar testing is something operators should perform routinely in case there are unexpected water quality changes. Some plants do daily jar testing, so the operators are prepared. The most common use of jar testing is to determine the appropriate use and dose of chemicals in water treatment. The objective of water treatment is clarification, the removal of particulate matter in the water. Particles Professor, I'm sorry. Suddenly the sound is stopped. I think because you mute the uh... the water to form fluff, yeah. so okay. larger <laughs> particles that are easier to remove. Effective particle removal is dependent on the operator applying the right doses of the proper chemicals. At the proper dose, turbidity removal is maximized. Beyond this point, an increased chemical dose yields little additional turbidity removal. Most surface water treatment plants use aluminum sulfate as the primary coagulant. It's difficult to overdose, so operators may add more than they really need. There won't really be a negative impact on the water, but overdosing is a waste of resources. Chemical dosing also affects the formation of fluff. If underdosing, poor flocculation can occur. However, if too much coagulant is added, the result will be mostly chemical flock, which doesn't settle as well and again, wastes chemicals. The proper balance must be achieved and can be found with jar testing. The basic jar test procedure involves collecting a sample of the raw water and adding progressively larger doses of the coagulant chemical to several jars of the sample. The results are used to identify the optimal condition for turbidity removal. Multiple jars are typically used to look at a series of different conditions and simulate multiple treatment characteristics. Okay, uh, do you see the uh, slide, PowerPoint slide? Okay, okay, right. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy right. Killen. I have my own medical practice, and I've oh. been using Doodly now for a few weeks to create these really fun <laughs> Sorry. Um, videos to... Okay. Okay, right. Um, PowerPoint. Can you see the f the slide about flocculation? Yes, we Full can screen? see. Full yeah. screen. Full screen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. So 
uh, talked about the flocculation and, and also this video, it shows that how it is done in, uh, in a laboratory, so-called jar test. So there are different versions and that's one way where you can have several jar test because it's done in a one liter jar, uh, like a beaker and you add chemicals and there is a mixing process. And then you can observe how the flocks are growing. And after that, you take the, you take the supernatant and you compare the dosages, which one is the best. And then you say that to the plant, yes, this is the best uh, dosage that we should use today. So flocculation is the second stage. First is the mixing and after that flocculation. So we are usually using so organic flocculants, polyacrylamides, but we are using them in very low dosages, one to 2% of uh, coagulants. But they're also costly, like 50 to 25 times costly as normal coagulants, but because we are using quite low amount, this does uh, actually does not matter. One advantage of uh, using flocculants is that it can reduce the sludge volume considerably. Sludge is the uh, precipitates or the, uh, the, the solid phase after treatment. So if you have more sludge, then you will have to pay more to transport them, right? And also you have to have more uh, volume uh, in your sedimentation tank, the, the sludge accumulation stages. So that's why it's an advantage to add uh, or increase the, uh, or reduce the amount of sludge. And surface load, that is the definition for the efficiency of sedimentation. Surface load is the flow divided by area. Flow is cubic meters per hour. Area is uh, square meters and the surface load is given as meters per hour. Normally in uh, coagulation, after coagulation, the surface load in a sedimentation tank would be 0 0.5 to maybe two or three meters per hour. But if you add polymers, you can make it even up to 10 if, if, if you really want to increase that. That means you can reduce the size of your sedimentation tank maybe two times, three times, four times by using flocculations. And there are two ways to do this uh, flocculation stage. It's called pedal flocculators and tube flocculators. So pedal flocculators, they look like this, uh, what is shown in the figure now. Right, so these are huge, huge propyls. So imagine that the room that you are in today or probably not in either this flocculation chambers are much higher, much bigger than the rooms that we have in our homes, but maybe like a big auditorium where a hundred people, maybe 50 people can sit in, right? So that's where the flocculation takes place. So we need to mix the water slowly, the whole water mass to create these flocks, which you saw in the video. How can we do that? Then we need to have this, uh, uh, we need to have these huge propels which mix us around. But this also need, requires some energy and sometimes at the bottom of these tanks there you can get sludge accumulated and then flocculators, these propels can get stuck and get burned down. So that's why there is a tendency to go away from these type of flocculators. So going for this, um, uh, let's say, channel uh, flocculators. So here is the normal way, like uh, flocculation chambers. And here is the fastest and slower and slower. And instead of that, some treatment plants, they have just removed these propels and they have changed, they put the walls like this. So water first go faster because the distance between the walls are smaller and then gradually the distance is increasing. So the water goes slower and slower. So it, it, it emulates the uh, flocculation chamber, which has become much more common now. And I said that there are three ways to separate. So we have done the mixing of coagulants with uh, our water and we have the flocculation done. So then we have flocks and water, but it is still in a kind of a soup, right? Now we have to separate. There are three ways to do that. We can do it by sedimentation. We can do it by flotation and filtration. 
So sedimentation tanks, so I um, don't know whether you have had lectures about that, but in generally a simplified picture is like this. So water comes here, water and particles, and they go down here. And it's kind of a funnel. And after that goes out, the treated water going out like here and the particles and the sludge, they go down here because of the weight. So the sludge is collected out from periodically and the treated water is taken out here. So this is the principle of a, a normal sedimentation tank. And if you would like to see how it is in reality, in practice, this is a big sedimentation tank, a circular sedimentation tank. Maybe they have a diameter of 15 or 20 meters. And uh, do you know how to how to identify the wastewater or how to identify a wastewater treatment plant if you take a flight? So if you look from the window and you take the next uh, flight to when you're coming to approaching a big city, then you will be seeing some, some circles, some uh, tanks, like four or five uh, such circles. That is the identification signal or that's when you can say that these are the sedimentation tanks of a wastewater treatment plant. That means the city's sedimentation, city's wastewater treatment plant is there. But under these uh, figures or the, or the photos, this you have these sedimentation tanks. So what, here you have the so-called scraper or a knife because particles are settled but this uh, bottom is not in such a big slope. So all the particles will naturally come in here. So this uh, scraper is slowly going around and collecting all the sludge into the bottom and the, from the bottom it's taking out. So this is a simple explanation of how the sedimentation tank works. And I also mentioned that flotation is, uh, is an interesting uh, concept which is used in drinking water treatment. For wastewater also we are using it, but it's not so often, but for drinking water it's quite uh, interesting because of flotation. Flotation is, um, it's as it says, it floats particles into the top. In sedimentation all the particles because of the gravity go down, but in flotation it goes up. It's to simply explain it, it's like when you are opening a Coca-Cola bottle, you see that bubbles are coming up, right? And if there were small particles in your Coca-Cola bottle, the bubbles will take those particles to the surface. The same thing happens in a flotation tank. So we add pressurized water at the bottom to, uh, to a tank where the flow water with the uh, flocks are there. And then these bubbles will come up to the surface. While they are coming up, they will take all the small particles up to the top. And then from the top, we can remove the, uh, the sludge. So this is the flot flotation tanks principle. And drinking water, you will see it quite often. In that. And then of course, there's a third one is filtration. Uh, there are many types of filtration. The, the simplest and oldest one is the, the uh, slow sand filters. And then we have the rabbit sand filters. And finally, we also have membrane filters. Uh, that's starting from ultra, uh, nano, and uh, reverse osmosis, uh, microfiltration, and different types of filters. So I'm not going to discuss about that, but you can learn more about those filters uh, in, uh, in other lectures. But in a typical drinking water treatment plant, we will have uh, several of these type of filters. It is to remove the flux and also to remove some of the taste and smell or the odor from our water. Then what we do is that instead of filling the filter with sand, we fill it with activated carbon. So in most cases, granular activated carbon. So when the, or it could also be powder activated carbon. And then when the water goes through that layer of activated carbon, it removes the color, means any, uh, organic toxic matter and smell and taste creating stuff. So uh, these are the three main uh, systems to separate. That's the sedimentation, flotation, and filtration. And let's have a look at the, 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 the latest developments in this stage. 
So imagine in a sedimentation tank, usually the depth of a sedimentation tank could be two meters to four meters, usually three meters, which means that the particles to complete the sedimentation, it has to travel from the top or the entry point until to the bottom, which is like two to three meters. So, and that's going to take time. That's why what we say is that it will take two hours or three hours sedimentation in the, such a process. Imagine that you fill that sedimentation tank with slanted plates. Let's say the different distance between the plates are about 10 centimeters. So the particles, they just have to travel only 10 centimeters instead of three meters. So, which means our sedimentation speed uh, could be much higher or the sedimentation process could be much, much uh, faster. So these are some examples. So here is the lamella, we call it as lamella system. So it means that we add plates in like a lamella. So what is coming in and what is going up and the particles, they just go down and stick to the, to the uh, plate and the particles then slip to the bottom. Sludge is taken out and drinking treated water is taken out from here. Um, it's the same with, uh, this is a photo of uh, tube flocculators and uh, there are some commercial systems called like super pulsator from uh, Degremont and there are many other suppliers in the industry. So, so many advantages, but there's also disadvantages. If you have a sedimentation tank without such plates, it's much more easier to clean it, right? Because you can, anyone can go in there and clean it. But imagine that you have to clean this type of, uh, yeah, so distance is between 10 centimeters and it could be so high as one meter or two meters. And it's not going to be an easy job. That's why there are commercially uh, patented systems to, to achieve this. But lamella, although it's expensive to, to have, once you have it, it's, you can reduce the volume and the area of sedimentation tank by maybe two times, three times, five times. Uh, so here is the, so yes, uh, the figure of the super pulsator from uh, Suez. And probably you also have some, some treatment plants with uh, these type of systems. So here you see the lamellas. And here is the scraper, the sludge is taken out. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's, it's here is the, uh, the uh, I think it's the, it could be a flotation here. I'm not sure. So anyway, so it's here, you see the sedimentation tank, it's covered with uh, plates and it could be something like this or it could be something like this plates. So these are the changes. And then I was thinking to show you some of the design alternatives uh, which we have in practice. Uh, so in this figure, design alternatives, the simplest one is mechanical treatment. You have a screen and then disinfection. So this one is usually used in, um, let's say in uh, when you have groundwater. Then gro when you have groundwater, then you don't even have to have a sieve. You can just add disinfection. That's the whole thing. Uh, but if you take water from a lake or a river, which is fairly, fairly good, that means no, almost no particles, then you can send it through a filtration system. So two media filter, that means two types of uh, sand types, different types of sizes. And then you can send it through uh, activated carbon, granular or, or, or powdered, which will remove the, any remaining organic matter and and uh, so taste and odor creating thing. And after that, you send it through a disinfection part. Sometimes if your water is very soft, then you have this uh, pH adjustment or alkalinity increasing stage. Uh, in Norway, for example, the water is quite soft. And uh, after coagulation treatment, the pH could be down to 6.5. If pH is so low, then it creates problem in the distribution system because the, when the pH is low, the corrosion patterns potential is higher. That means our tubes, pipes, distribution pipes will be corroded much faster. Therefore, in our treatment plants, we adjust the, the final pH to around eight by adding uh, a base. So 
then the the most common system without filtration is uh, with coagulation of the the sieves and we sometimes we adjust the ph so that the ph is especially if you have a uh, soft water at the coagulant mixing add polymers then we have the flocculation then sedimentation and then disinfection this is the most common one right but now we have uh, much more advanced systems that in addition to the common part which i discussed before showed and then we have the filters to make our water much more cleaner so then you have surely a good water quality we could also have flotation here is sedimentation flotation so we add uh, dispersed air or the pressurized air into the system so the sludge is taken out from here the treated water is going higher and here sedimentation sludge is out and treated water is going out and after that is the same going through these filters right and there are much more uh, efficient systems. There are two systems called direct, fi direct filtration and contact filtration. In this case, in the direct filtration, you have a flocculation stage, but there is no sedimentation. So which means that you don't need to make sludge so the flock so bigger. So it goes directly to the filtration stage and it takes out. But contact filtration, there is no flocculation at all. The flock construction, flock building takes place inside the filtration system so for situations where the turbidity and suspended solids are much low so this is a much efficient system but if you have more particles then you should go for a, uh, even uh, having a separation stage before you send to the the filters otherwise the filter will be clogged much faster so i found this uh, diagram from the treatment plant in bali Petana water treatment plant, and you see it's, there is aeration. So aeration is having usually to take out uh, maybe ammonia or nitrogen or any other uh, oxidative stuff or something from the, especially aeration is there when you are using the groundwater because groundwater has, for example, iron uh, in, um, in ferrous stage. So you aerate it and you remove convert our ferrous into ferrous. Pre-sedimentation, if it is necessary uh, to take some of the science and that stuff and the coagulation, flocculation, and then sedimentation, filtration, carbon reservoir, and through the dis distribution. Sludge is taken out, sludge is taken to the sludge processing system. So I'm sure that uh, there are a number of uh, systems over here is the plant from the Badak Singha water treatment plant. In Bandung, it's the collection, screen, coagulation, flocculation stage, and after that, it goes to the first uh, separation stage. But it can also go to this lamella type things, and after that, rapid sand filters. Probably there is also a carbon filter, and after that, it goes to the treatment system. And here, it's the chlorine addition. So uh, an interesting another concept is uh, this uh, ballasted uh, treatment process. Ballasted means that we add a ballast to our wastewater. There are two types. We can add micro sand or magnetite particles. So micro sands, so I mentioned about the coagulants. There was an idea to have uh, silica uh, or um, water glass into coagulants. But here what we do is that we add micro sands the sub-micron liver, uh, the microns or sub-millimeter level into our raw water. And then here is the addition and the flocculation takes place and the flocks are building surrounding these particles. And the flocks are much heavier than without sand particles. So then the water goes to the lamella stage, sediments much faster, and but we are not wasting our micro sand. So the sludge is taken here back using a hydrocyclone and you take out the micro sand and add it here. So in practice, the we are wasting less than 5% of micro sand in this process. But the advantage is the sedimentation time it reduced from three hours to 10 to 12 minutes. So if you have a treatment plant where you have a big problem with the space, if you want to increase the capacity of your treatment plant by twice or five times, you can introduce this type of a system and you can reduce the volume and area which is used by the sedimentation tanks. 
I also mentioned about magnetite particles. Magnetite particles means that the uh, some special particles which has mag magnetic uh, properties. So you add magnetite here and here, and instead of going through sedimentation process or separation process, it, the the sludge goes through two strong magnet mag mag mag. Uh, uh, Magnetic, what's that? Uh, uh, magnetic fields. So all the magnetic particles they stick into the the wall, and after that you stop the magnetism there, and you collect the particles and you clean it and send it back. So there's a nice, interesting things are coming up. So let's look at the wastewater part. So here is the if you are using coagulation for wastewater. So mechanical process is the most common: screens, grit removal, sedimentation, and disinfection. Biological treatment is the same as this part, mechanical part, and after that it goes to a biological actuated sludge plant, sedimentation, disinfection. Coagulation or the chemical part is without biology. We add chemicals, flocculation, sedimentation. But now the requirements are so strong that uh, it is not enough to have mechanical, chemical, or biological. Most often they are combined with different systems. So these are different combinations where the biology and uh, chemical coagulation is added. So here, the first one is simultaneous. That means we add chemicals directly to the aqueous sludge basin. And then we have the pre-precipitation where we have the chemical process first, and then the biology. And we have the post-precipitation where we have the biology first and coagulation after that. So that was uh, that was what I was thinking to uh, present today. So I hope that you could follow the lecture, and um, and uh, that you know much more about coagulation, and you are becoming a specialist of coagulation, and you will have an interest to work with coagulation in your in your future studies and career. Thank you very much. Any questions in the meantime? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ratnavira. I think we still have about 10 minutes to have a Q&A or discussion. Uh, and maybe before we go to the uh, students' question, actually last week uh, in the among the lectures of our program study, we have, a, we have an interesting discussion about the shape of the jar for jar tests. Uh, we thought there are two possibilities. We can use the cylinder types or the box types as you show it in your video. Uh, do you think, is there any significance different or if you, have any comment on that uh, shape of the jar test? I think I'm always using the cylinder type, right? Okay. But uh, these, uh, some of these American uh, companies, they are, especially from Pips and Bird, and they are using the square type. I think the mm -hmm. square type introduces unnecessary uh, errors to the system because when you have a square type, the mixing is not even. The corners mm -hmm. of the square, it gives a different type of mixing. So you don't, you can't have a unified uh, mixing. So I would have gone for cylinders. And another advantage is that you can buy one liter cylinders as lab equipment. And if you break ones, you just, just buy another one. The square ones, you have to buy from a company which made, makes that and they are making money on that. Okay. I see. Okay, thank you for your answer, <laughs> Professor. Okay, now we have a question from a student. Uh, his name is Toku Uh His question uh, is, there were various types of coagulants. Are all the types of coagulant effective for use in all wastewater or depending on the type or content of the wastewater? And that is his question, Professor. Yes. Um, yes, That's um, that depends on the... Well, I would say that any coagulant will work in any water, but the efficiency will differ, be depending on the type of the coagulant. So for example, if your water has a low alkalinity and low pH, then you should choose a coagulant which works at a lower pH. But if you have a coagulant with high alkalinity and higher pH, which means that your pH is around, let's say around 7.5 and after addition of coagulants, you will be ending up around pH seven. 
So then iron is not a very good coagulant because iron will not work at pH 7 in a proper way. So it will work at lower levels. That's, uh, that's one way to think about. And if you don't have uh, an issue with uh, particles, then you could also find a different type of coagulant. So if you're using the lake water where the particles are much uh, less, then you can think of uh, having uh, more expensive, more efficient like uh, pre-polymerized coagulants than uh, the aluminum sulfate. So, and there are other reasons to think, uh, look at also. The, so for example, the, um, the uh, transport costs, because usually coagulants have a concentration of five to 10%, which means that if you are transporting 10 tons of coagulants, nine, you are transporting nine or nine and a half tons of water, right? And if, you're, if your factory for coagulant production is, if you have a factory very close by like 10 kilometers, then it's fine. But if you have to transport your coagulant for 100 kilometers or 200, then transport costs of you are transporting 95% of water, right? So there are different things, uh, not only the price you have to think about. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, Rizky, do you have any follow-up question? Uh, no, Ms. Ms. Paraga. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Rizky. And maybe another question from... Wait a second, sir. Uh, I'm 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 starting another meeting. Okay. Can we so, yes? Can we take uh, these uh, questions? I I can ha answer them by email, or I will take them at the next uh, meeting, please. Okay. Okay. Sure. I will compile the the question and then right. maybe send you to uh, send you by email. Right. Uh, right. If you if you don't mind, before we close our session, can we take a, a group picture? Uh, yes. In the, in the sense. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, kepada mahasiswa mohon uh, di on kan dulu videonya. Oke, okay, uh, we will take a group picture of this of our first session. Oke, okay, uh, we will start the uh, Group picture, okay. Have you ready? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, uh, one more. 